Hi, and welcome to another episode of Ecom at One. And today's guest is Andy Burkett. Now, Andy, I have known for pretty much on the nose 20 years. And that's because we worked together for 20 years, give or take. I think we maybe had six months off of good behavior between us, haven't we? <laughs> Just about, we're yeah. there. And Andy is the lead technical engineer at Econ One and SEO Traffic Lab, which is both of my you know, and our agencies. Um, how are you doing, Andy? You okay? I'm doing really well, thanks. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Good, good. So Andy is still, still, in, still in lockdown, I'm looking to come back to the office in a couple of weeks um, with, a, with a bit of luck. So yeah. um, I've made it back to the office now. I'm sort of a couple of weeks into my return, um, as are quite a lot of the team. But Andy's um, coming in in a couple of weeks. So I think um, what would be great, Andy, is just to sort of say, really kick off and ask you really, what do you think is the sort of one thing you wish you knew about digital marketing before you started this journey? Oh, crikey. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, one thing, I think, I, not so much a thing that I knew. I think what I would have liked to have known before I started in this. And bear in mind, I didn't, I didn't come to digital marketing. You know, I was quite late to the game. Um, I, I wish I'd understood more about how dynamic the the role was you know it's not a a lot of people think that it's a, a fixed point you sort of come along you learn how to do this and that's what you do for the rest of your career well um if that's what you're thinking then it, you'll get a pretty big shock when you enter the world of digital marketing it's an ever-changing dynamic role you're always learning something new um it, you know I, I think if i'd have known that beforehand i might have a few less gray hairs than i've got now Wow. Uh, it's, uh, but yeah be be prepared to be constantly learning things are changing you know the algorithms change all the time uh things even stuff with the feeds is changing constantly things getting updated there's always ways to improve things yeah uh, there's always new things coming out so yeah i think i, I think if i'd understood that a bit i'd have been a bit more prepared for <laughs> for the role really so yeah. it's i mean it's an enjoyable role i love it you know it's um i think we see it um obviously we have you know obviously quite a few staff um, team members staff members and you know every year we're recruiting two three four people you know through our apprentice track um, graduate track in our businesses and you know the one thing that sort of stands out is that mindset piece is what you're saying of, of you know the, the reality is when these people come in you know well, you can see straight away the ones that you know are really going to do well or the ones that, you know, most of them do, but the ones that are going to do well, that's an open mindset to, you know, going into something and just keep learning, 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 learning. And clearly they get to a point where they're incredible at it quite quickly. You know, we can find, you know, within a year or two, you know, people are super smart in, in their specific talent, but it's more that mindset and that culture fit to the business where they're, willing to keep learning willing to keep yeah, you know, yeah you've got you've got to be you've got to be willing to learn and it's not a it's not really a nine to five job either you know it, it's you know you you might get to half past four on a friday and think yeah weekend's here and then something goes wrong with the feed or yeah. you know you've got to be prepared to say well this client pays us to look after that for them so yeah. i'm not going yeah. home until it's resolved and <laughs> you need that sort of I don't know whether it's a mentality or, or what but yeah. Yeah. I think you need to be a bit crazy to do this job as well so <laughs> well, this is, that's the thing I guess you know obviously it's all 24 7 isn't it all of our clients are you know generating leads selling products all day every day and yeah yeah like, you can't you can't just switch challenge off. yeah you know yeah. it's okay. not like the feed stops working when you leave work like it's still going on in the background and sometimes in the morning you'll come in and it's like oh christ what's happened there sort of thing but yeah. you, you've got to be able to i think you've got to be able to react it, it is what i'm saying you you know it, yeah. it's not a come in sit down and do job you know not like a lot of jobs where you'll come in and you'll do the same thing day in day out you don't in this job, which is probably one of the things I like about it, to be fair. Yeah, I'm yeah. a bit of a... So obviously, yeah. you've not always done digital marketing, you know, as, as I haven't, and, um, but we've done it for a long, long time. Um, but what would you say sort of your, your turning point in your career? Yeah, um, crikey, yeah. I mean, like you say, it's, it's not, you know, I, I didn't come into, I think I was in my 40s, yeah. yeah, so I, I consider myself quite late coming to the game of digital marketing. 
I would say that when I did do that, it was a turning point. I'm an engineer by trade. Yeah. You know, I'm a, a, I was a packaging engineer. Yeah. That's where I learned my trade. You always, always had that sort of technical mind. Yeah, I've always been. Wow. Even when I first started working for you, you know, when I first started working for you, we was a retail business. Yeah. Um, and I was a technician building and repairing computers. Yeah. So, so those, yeah. those guys listening to the podcast, um, so Andy and myself have worked together for 20 years, which is a crazy, you know, in, in I think in digital marketing years, that's probably a hundred years, isn't it? I don't know if that's a thing. Yeah. So we had a, we had a retail business, a distribution business, an e-commerce business all, all under one umbrella, but we had different routes to market. So Andy very much ran, well, you ran very, very many different departments over the years, um, but they all had that technical slant to them, whether it was building yeah, all... thousands of computers a year or managing our network. We had about 40 staff in the, in the retail business and the yeah. e-commerce business. Um, and then that led on to, you know, we were, we were an e-commerce store selling online you know, about 11 years ago. We, we stopped, or, well, we stopped part of it and we sold yeah. off part of it. Um, and then this is where we transitioned into the agencies that we have now. And then you obviously transitioned from doing our SEO to doing clients SEO to doing feeds to doing. So we're very much we have a um, you know we have a very technical um, episode ahead of us here. So that's what I want to get mm. stuck into. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, uh, I think my, basically I, I, I'm a, I'm a problem solver. Uh, you know that that's what I do that's what I do in my job so yeah I like you know I like puzzles I like challenges um it's not always conducive to to my health and uh what, you know what hair I've got left but um so the turning point really for me was when you made the decision to to shut down the retail side of the business and saw enough in me to say come along on this journey with me Andy I think we're going to do something amazing and you know from the early days when there was just me and you yeah and yeah. I've pretty much done I think I'm probably apart from yourself the only person in the company that's done pretty much every role within the marketing side so I've yeah. done you know I've done the SEO I've done client management I've done yeah all the technical stuff. The turning point for me is the technical stuff. I think that's where I'm happiest. It's where I'm yeah. comfortable. Yeah. You know, when you said to me, right, I want you to become lead technical engineer. You know, that was the sort of ambition achieved, yeah. if you like. And, yeah. you know, obviously there's still places for me to go and there's still stuff that yeah. I want to do, which, like I say, you, you're forever learning in this job. So you, yeah. you, it doesn't stand still. But like but I say, it, I am a problem, you know, I'm a problem yeah. solver. That's what I enjoy doing. So, yeah, we, we certainly do day in, day out. So obviously you, most of our listeners are e-com stores, you know, e-com at one. Um, and really let's, let's have a real focus on feeds and sort of merchant center feeds, merchant center, a bit of a, bit of a sort of, um, you know, a bit of a, I guess, not secretive, but a bit of a sort of mystery, I guess, you know, feed. Oh yeah. We take a feed from our Magento or Shopify. We push it into this, that and the other, and we do, we do shopping. Well, as you know, and as we know, as an agency, there's a bit more to it than that. So, uh, yeah. I wish it was that simple. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's a, obviously we have a whole business that is geared around, you know, is, is predominantly geared around feeds that then feed into campaigns that sell, you know, hundreds plus million pounds worth of stuff a year. So, we know feeds, well, you know feeds inside out. So I think for those that are listening that are maybe getting started, that are, that are sort of on their start of their journey, you know, what is a data feed and what is Merchant Center? Yeah, okay. So um, the data feed uh, in its simplest form is a way of sending um, large amounts of structured data. Um, it's current data and up-to-date data, um, usually for use from a website or an app or some sort of online tool. Um, there's generally two kinds. There's product feeds um, and in our industry there's a news feed as well which if you see a blog or anything like that, you, you know, like, like the old RSS feeds, yeah. That's, yeah. They, that sort of thing. Um, generally for product feeds, which is mainly what we'll talk about, they are either in XML or uh, CSV format. Yeah. And they are generated by something within your e-commerce store. 
um, in most instances, um, that'll be a plugin that um, goes straight, straight into your your yeah. back office system um, and generates a file by pulling certain fields from the product information that you've already got in the site. So the bulk of the work's done already because you've got all your product data there. It's yeah. a way of taking that product data out yeah. and giving it to a publisher. Um, and by publishers, I mean things like um, Amazon Store or, yeah. in our case, Google Shopping or PLAs, so product yeah. listing ads. So we've got that feed. We've got it either in this in the, in the <coughs> one or two formats, and it's got various data in it. And then we then we we sync link point that to merchant centers so just just explain yeah. that sort of process and, and what the merchant center is for for the listeners yeah so mer merchant center is basically google's management tool yeah to take a feed um you have to have a google account obviously to be able to do it yeah. um it, you upload the feed there in order for the products to be checked basically and yeah. verified that they're allowed to be um because obviously uh, google have a, a set of rules yeah. um that you must adhere to for those products to become visible on on shopping channel yeah um so for example there's certain attributes that you must have within the feed um, and yeah. things like it has to be unique you know every, every product has to have a unique id yeah. they have to have a title uh, yeah. a link to the product uh, price yeah. uh, and a link to an image product. So if you upload a feed and you haven't got some of these, Merchant Center will tell you you're missing X, Y, Z, and that's where yeah. you then look at going back in, adjusting you know, the data set, adding stuff in, liaising with the client, liaising with the store owner to say, right, we're missing these. You know, If you've uploaded 2,000 SKUs, you might find that so many are missing this, that, and the other. And there's like 500 things that are missing maybe. Doing that piece of work, um, to make sure that feed is, is is full, would that be right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, you know, as long as you've got those those items in, you can have a pretty basic feed up and running fairly quickly. Um, yeah. And then it's a case of working, like you say, working with the client. Yeah. Um, in generally, it's it's an odd one because a lot of a lot of clients that either don't have a dev and they're doing all the work themselves or they have devs and it costs money to do that so sometimes it can be a bit of a battle getting them to add some of those bits in but yeah yeah so so you've got you want to liaise with the client and make sure that you know ultimately it's in their interest if products are missing certain data those product products won't be allowed and won't, won't be passed so you end up with 80 percent of your SKUs going through or whatever it may be and then that can affect other sort of factors in your account you know if you don't have a, a certain score i believe within your merchant center yeah something that not a lot of people know about it's something called high score i believe yeah i mean that's something that was introduced uh it's about middle of last year i believe so it's relatively new still but like i say not a lot of people know about it yeah um it does affect the way your products will perform on yeah. on um google shopping yeah. it is a twofold thing now so part of it's due to merchant center and part of it's in the um adwords account itself yeah um but each each section um has a score basically and the the higher the score the the, yeah. the more likely your products are to show and perform better what would be the sort of top three things you think or a couple of things that you think that obviously people won't be familiar with the high score that are listening it's quite a guarded thing i know you guys you and probably three or three of the guys went down like mid or sort of mid in sort of second quarter i think last year wasn't yeah, it yeah yeah it was yeah to h to google and um they did a whole sort of afternoon on high school um what what sort of a couple of the key things i think we've maybe touched on one you're obviously making sure that you are you know you've got all your variables in there but what would be a couple of other key areas yeah i mean it, one of the big things with it is is trying to maintain what i call a clean a clean feed or a green feed so if you yeah. look in your merchant center you know uh, anything that's coming up as a warning yeah will be in so that google use a, a traffic light system basically so red red means it won't get shown yeah amber is sort of yeah we'll show it but you're not going to perform quite as well as you would if if it was green and then green obviously is everything's brilliant let's crack yeah. on and sell some product yeah um obviously red will stop things appearing in the feed and the higher the percentage 
of those. So if you've got high percentage of, say we've got 4,000 products yeah, and a thousand of those are getting disapproved, but 3,000 yeah. are going through fine. So there's going to be a percentage of those products showing up with disapprovals in the merchant center. Yeah. The lower that percentage, I, I, me personally, I like to see none of those errors above 1%. So you're looking your, at 99%, 99% green is what we're yeah. for as a, as yeah. a minimum or as a but, target. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a target we sort of set ourselves. You, yeah. you can, you know, I would say definitely no more than sort of two, 3%. Yeah. Um, okay. And obviously, so, the better that score, the better your feed will. It, it is a performance factor. So, yeah. you know, yeah. you live with it yourself if you don't deal with it. So, so great takeaway there, guys. You know, you're, if, if you're using um, Merchant Center, you're using a feed already, you know, straight away, get in your merchant feed, get in your merchant account, you know, your Google Merchant account, and um, look at your percentage, you know, and if it is low, you know, you might think to yourself, and we do get this, you might think to yourself, well, Okay, it's twenty percent. You know, that's been disallowed, but it doesn't matter because they're not products that want to sell. But it does matter because you might not want to sell them. But what you're saying to Google is, you know, I've got an eighty percent high score, or, or that element of the high score is eighty percent. There's other elements. Yeah. Um, if so you've got... you either want to take those products out of the feed, you yeah. know, or you want to adjust them so they are in there correctly. You know, there's no excuse. You know, because. Yeah, I think quite you know quite often people are just get busy, lazy, whatever you want to call it, and, and they leave SKUs in there, don't they? And it's really making sure that it's clean, super clean. Okay, yeah, so definitely, if you you just touch on that last bit that you said, yeah. Rich, if you know if if you've got products you know you're not interested in selling, you've no wish to sell, yeah. take them out of feed. Yeah, you know, don't don't have them. Don't just don't just dump your entire product catalog in there and then sort of vote for the best. Yeah. You know, yeah, so yeah. you really have to think about it. And this is where a lot of people come and stop. They don't, you know, they think it's a, oh, everything's in there. It's all, yeah. oh, yeah, I've got a few that. Sure. So we've got our feed, we've created our feed, we put it in our merchant center, you know, and, and we've, we've adjusted some things in terms of, you know, the, the, the level of percentage that is allowed. But what would you say some of the sort of how can we simplify, automate that process to speed things up using some technology automations to, to create a better feed? What would you say? Um, I mean, in, in Merchant Center itself, the, there's a few things that you can do. It, yep. Obviously, um, regardless of whether your catalog changes regularly or not, I would say you should be pulling that feed at least once a week you yeah. can pull it as many as you know if your catalog changes a lot and regularly you can change your feed and update your feed as much as four times a day yeah i mean that's a big one isn't it because you've got yeah. so many people out there i think that's you know we i get asked that a lot oh we've got a lot of products that got stop how are you going to cope with that i don't want to be putting adverts out there for things we don't sell well if you're updating the feed four times a day obviously yeah. that can alleviate the majority of those SKUs because if something's out of stock, it's not then when the feed goes and grabs it again, or the merchant center goes and grabs it again, um, the um, the product will show out of stock and then the ads will not show based on yeah. the criteria that you've set. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's things, you know, that's a question we get asked a lot, even, even on the SEO side, you know, if a product's out of stock, what do I do about it sort of thing? You know, well, if it's, if it's coming back into stock definitely then you know don't remove it from the feed just just update the feed make yeah. sure that it shows you know that it's an important criteria to show in the feed that it's out of stock yeah and, you know so i mean there are rules you can write if you want to temporarily remove items from a feed uh, you can do that in merchant center as well i mean we we use a tool to do a lot of ours just because it's easier and it's a yep. much nicer interface than Merchant Center. Yep. You can schedule regular updates. Um, you do that right at the beginning when you're doing a feed. That's probably one of the easiest automations. But I would say make sure uh, most our feeds we update daily. Yeah. You know, yep. regardless of whether yeah. um, it, it highlights other problems that may not yeah. be quite as noticeable because i think i know i we've seen obviously as we said at the beginning we've, we've been doing this a long time so we've seen people that have come to us we look at their feed and it hasn't been updated for a year well clearly 
doesn't matter who you are. Yeah. Some things are seriously out of stock. You know, some yeah. things are not been sold for years. You know, we have we have certain clients, don't we, that only get small run of products. So they only get, you know, a small batch of, of high-end sort of allocation from certain high-end brands. They only get five of this product, five of this SKU. So really challenging to get volume because you haven't got volume to sell, but you still want to push them through, sell them. So obviously once they're sold, the, the fee gets updated and shows it out of stock. Those products then don't trigger in the Google index. Um, so, um, how, so how can an, an e-commerce business optimize its feed, you know, even more? So we've got this sort of standard feed, if you like, that can come through, you know, and that's quite often what you see as a start point. You've got this feed that comes through from the store, goes to the merchant center, and then from the merchant center pushes through to the AdWords account, you know, and you run your ads. And that's sort of a start point for most e-com stores but what we're saying you know is well that's a start point but what are some of the things that we can really do and people listening in can really do to that feed to optimize it to make sure that they get you know more bang for the buck with the, with the google shopping you know in, in the feed yeah well, that's a good question actually um so in the old days you'd have had to make sure that your feed was as good as it could be at source so within your your e-commerce platform um but the, that's the real power now of Merchant Center um, in its new iteration. So it, it depends how long you've been using Merchant Center, but Merchant Center interface the new is new. So yeah. there's a lot of new features been added into the current version of Merchant Center. It's been long overdue. Mm-hmm. I think it was the last platform that Google decided to really look at. Um, they have a, a system to write customized rules yeah. Now, so you can add things um, like custom labels, which we use all the time, as you know. Yeah. Um, they can all be added within Merchant Center. Um, yeah. it, it is basically a so if then do this sort yeah. of scenario. So it's maybe give an example of a what would be your go to um, custom variable, custom label. If any, I mean, straight away, the, what's your go to custom label you would create for an account? Yeah, custom layer. I mean, for, for us, we use things like um, what we call price breaks. Yeah. So to to you know you you don't want to be bidding the same price. You know, if you've got a product that's twenty pound and a product that's two hundred pound, you don't want to be getting the same bid on those products because okay, you're going to lose yeah. out on yeah. some of them massively. Um, so we use a thing uh, called product price break. Yeah. Uh, it's a custom label and we will look at an account and look at the price range of the products and then create price bands within. Yeah. Uh, so generally we use custom label zero unless it's already being used. Yeah. Um, but there's other things you can do. Um, so, and a lot of this you can do without interfering with the feed at source. So for example, if you're doing, um, garments so you're selling you know shirts and things like that that are yeah. different sizes different colors you'll quite often put that information in the title but not necessarily within the feed itself yeah. there are attributes for that within yeah. you know yeah. the product set for um clothing is is quite comprehensive yeah they won't stop products being uh, shown in Google yeah. ads, so they won't get disapproved if you leave them out. Yes, but they will obviously perform better, yeah. and you can extract that data yeah. using the new rules. So, if you, for example, have got um, red check shirt size XL, red check shirt size L, etc., yeah. you can pull the color. For example, you can extract that data from the title. Yeah. So you can then populate the color feed by saying, "Look at." look at the title and if yeah. if you have to provide a list basically yeah. of yeah. colors and then uh, they populate the color uh, variable yeah 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 and so it populates another yeah. part of the data that then ticks off a thing on your data saying oh actually i've gone from 4000 products where the that field wasn't being used yeah so it, it increases the performance of that product same with site product size clothing is a good example actually because yeah. there's lots of variables yeah. you know with clothing so you've got size you've got color yeah. um you know and and male female yeah uh, and, it, and it's one yeah. that people tend not to so they tend to put that stuff in description they don't tend to put it into fields 
even yeah. though most most CMS platforms you end up with literally a fifty variables for one SKU. Yeah, color if you size. you know it's some degree, of our yeah. products have got eight, nine, ten thousand product SKUs. Yeah. If I go to that customer and say, "Oh, by the way, you've got to go and add color." <laughs> into 10, they're going to go it's a bad uh, day yeah how important well, is it andy is it you know yeah, yeah. Um, am my products going to get disapproved yeah, if i don't yeah. put that yeah at the minute no they're not but yeah. they're not going to perform as well but so it's like we're, we're they, basically what we're doing here then is we are we're taking this feed and rather than you know the reality is you know most people may have spent some time doing some of their seo on their site but they know quite often that may, maybe they've done some work on the categorization subcategorization you know, and pulled that through. But they're probably always quite often behind the curve with their SEO naming convention, you know, things are changing. You know, they might've got so far work with an agency for so long, but then new sets of products come in. But what, 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 what this means we can do is we can SEO the feed rather than SEOing the website and having to do two, you know, having to go, oh God, we've got to change everything on the website yeah. again. You're joking. Well, we haven't. What you yeah. do, you work in the merchant feed, feed and agree as a team and say, right, well, actually we've got these products but we don't mention the fact we're just saying it's a size 12 black Pegasus 37. Well, that's a Nike, but we don't mention Nike because it's a Nike store. So you don't necessarily mention the brand on the description, you know, not always, no. um, but that's a big mistake for our sort of a uh, merchant because when you take it, when you isolate it away from your website and push it into merchant feed, put it into an advert, put it onto the Google first page as an ad, does, you're not on the website, are you anymore? You're on no. Google's. Like, go, are you on Google? So you need that naming convention, sort of SEO namings. You know the yeah, research. You've got to, you've got to yeah. outperform. Uh, you know, yeah. you, it, it's just the same as SEO. You're up against other competition within yeah. the shopping channel. So you've got to yeah. be smart. You've got to outperform yeah. those people. And the one way of doing that is by optimizing the feed. You know, not using it, even descriptions. Yeah, you, you, we had a client where their description requirement for the website was that they had to put key ingredients of a product. Yeah, um, but those key ingredients would get the products disapproved in Merchant Center. Yeah, yeah. So we wrote rules to change some of the descriptions. Remove. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> and now it's it's a bit more complicated now because yeah. they've changed the guidance on that again so if it's on page they'll still yeah. get disapproved now but we've done things like you know there's nothing really that you can't edit or change yeah within merchant center so what what i'm saying basically is you you can do this work without having to go back to the client or say to the client i need this changing and they've got to go to their dev and their dev comes back and say yeah we'll do that for you it's another 500 quid yeah. you know, or a thousand pound or whatever. So you can do those processes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the time. Anyway, some of them are quite complicated to write unless you're using so a third party tool. But, yeah. So it's developed a lot, the merchant center, you know, as, as oh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's own right. Um, and then obviously there are third party tools that sort of layer on, you know, and we're getting one of our third party tool partners, um, well, I'm chatting to them at the moment. They may be on the podcast soon. I'm just um, <laughs> sorting out a few things with That'd them. Good We've got a few things in the pipeline with them, so we'll keep that under wraps for now. Um, but um, you know, obviously, feeds is is it's like the you know it's like well, you've got a website, and that website for me, you know, it's got to be on a solid platform. You know, you've got a Shopify, Magento, you know, and it's a solid type, you know, a solid foundation, and you're. Google shopping ads is similar in that you need to get the foundation right with your merchant center and your feed. It's yeah. no good. The amount of times that we see people saying, oh, we tried Google shopping. It doesn't work. You know, and you can sort of say that insert any sort of marketing, um, you know, SEO, Facebook ads, whatever it may be into that conversation. You know, I tried Facebook ads. It didn't work. Tried Google shopping. It didn't work. Tried shopping ads. It didn't work. And usually, you know, the, the key sort of ingredient why it didn't work is because they took a feed pushed it in and went live with some basic ads and that's the mistake well you know and what andy's saying there is you know you know you can take that feed you can then manipulate that data add in extra variables we can pull the data the data four times a day so you're not your feeds fresh up to date whereas some of your competitors might be doing it once a day or once a week or once a month and advertising on stuff that's out of stock and you know it's paying for clicks that when they get there it says out of stock you know and then you're like oh why am i seeing an ad if it's out of stock you're saving money there 
you've got a high score you know this this sort of elusive high score that you're trying to get in in the account so it's really you know this feed piece is a fundamental piece um within within the sort of the whole google shopping sort of ecosphere you know where you know you need to get this right so i think another one that i get asked andy um quite a lot you know a lot is well well, well our our sort of our shipping rates and our shipping table you know it's very complicated google shopping just can't handle that you know we ship to we ship all around the world we ship to jersey we ship to this that and the other we've got different couriers you know how can how does the merchant center deal with that how can you set up quite complicated short shipping tables is that something the merchant center can do well yeah yeah that's another good question actually yeah um merchant center itself so you can pass shipping information either within the feed yeah so you can pass that directly from your um cms your back office yeah or it's got its own uh, shipping matrix so you can build a shipping matrix they can be quite complicated if if they need to be yeah um, a lot of people get put off by the, the fact that it, it can be if if your shipping's not majorly complicated then they're relatively easy to set up so they yeah. use a a table system or well there's different ways you can do it actually so um but people that have got complicated um shipping systems um i think we see that a bit where some of the items can be quite heavy and yeah. you've got you know different zones to ship to and all this sort of thing um you can put all that in the merchant center then yeah yeah you can put all that in the merchant center and of course another way of looking at it is to look at your i think is you know one of our colleague henry's one of his favorite sayings is the h20 rule um and actually look at your products and say right well actually these these products are easily shippable you know they've got a fairly standard flat rate so the smaller products that you ship i would say will all come under you sort of normal royal mail shipping standards and all that yeah. sort of thing so if you can ship those easily yeah then create your feed with those products yeah so you know look at look at your products as a whole and say yeah. right out of those products what 20 percent of my products that have got a good value and, and i can ship on a good standard system standard rate let's take those and put those in the feed yeah initially get a feed up and running see if it's going to work for you if it's going to yeah. work for you then you start scratching your head and saying right these more complicated you can you yeah. can set up separate shipping yeah. tables as well by the way so you don't it's not just one, just one. We layer them, layer yeah you can them. layer them in so you can say right this is this is my normal royal mail shipping so i've got all these products i can ship by royal mail that's straightforward it's either this much this much or this much yeah, yeah. So i think yeah yeah and then you can look at couriers and say right if i want to ship courier i've got to do it by weight yeah so sometimes that means add, adding extra fields into yeah. your feed so there yeah. are the fields for shipping weight and yeah. you know you can do shipping labels as well so you can say if it's got this label within the feed this is the shipping rate that it goes at so it's a really uh, comprehensive system yeah. yeah so i think the big takeaway there is those that are listening in that are maybe holding off setting up shopping you know um you know is you know sort out that you know the 80 20 as we all know you know you're going to have those core lines that or those core weights as it may be you know or locations that are the bulk of your orders so sort out that shipping matrix get those products in get those shipping you know then layer in but while you're layering in you're making money on the on the on the bulk you know don't let that be a hold up and obviously if you get stuck ping andy andy at econ1.com he'll more than you know jump on a call and give you a hand with that as well yeah. might regret saying that but <laughs> <laughs> um, um, don't don't i would say don't let anything you know don't let anything there's no blockers yeah. to, to you having a crack at Google shopping. Yeah. Especially now, you know, now Google with the COVID-19 incident, you know, they've, they've given you an option to actually show your products for free within certain yeah. places. Yeah. So there's no reason really yeah. for anybody that can produce a feed yeah. from their system, not to have a crack at it. And if it proves yeah. to you that way, you, you know, you, you, you'll never get rid of 
the paid option because the paid option yeah. it, it, there is so much you can do to optimize that and outperform everybody else so so but it gives you an opportunity to do it and see if it's viable yeah yeah so what we're referring to there is google announced um, about 10 weeks ago that they were bringing back sort of free Google shopping, but obviously in inverted commas, because... Everybody thought it was great, yeah. didn't they, mate? <laughs> hey, we're going back to free Google days. That was the headline. That was the, click, <laughs> that was the clickbait sort of thing. Free Google shopping. Oh, but obviously, then all the sort of have-a-go heroes jumped in. It's not free. Well, of course, there is a free option, but it's not. The sort of headline is not you go to Google and get free Google shopping ads. The, the headline is you go to the Google shopping tab and you can list your products in there somewhere for free. So mm. we sort of um, like um, had the analogy of, well, you're not getting a shop. You're not getting Google aren't giving you a shop on the high street. They're giving you a shop on one of the back streets, but they're still giving you a shop. Yeah, they're still they're still giving you a, some passing some passing trade, but you're not getting ten thousand cars driving past every hour. You get a few people walking past and a few uh, a one way a one way street maybe. Um, so that's been rolled out um, in the US completely. We, uh, my understanding, um, I don't, is it in the UK yet? I don't think I've not seen it yet. It, it, the I mean, in Merch Centre, it shows up as surfaces, what's surfaces. known as surfaces. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we are seeing that in all yeah. of our feeds now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we have a couple of clients that obviously they do uh, ship internationally as well. Yeah. So yeah. they are getting what you actually see in Merchant Centre is, is paid clicks and what's known as non paid. Yeah. So you've got your normal Google shopping where you're paying for. Yeah. And then you've got this other feed that is non play So it's almost like organic clicks, yeah, but yeah, within yeah. the shopping. So that's one there to watch, guys. That's one yeah. we've got to keep an eye on. I think, um, you know, it's um, it's coming, you know. So we keep an eye on the channels, keep an eye on the podcast, keep an eye on the blog. We've got a, we've got a blog on, on the Econ One regarding this free Google shopping um, element, which Henry, the head of ads, um, has put on. And we're going to update that as sort of the UK has some more announcements so that's sort of quite a recent you know last couple of months but what else Andy would you say you know we've got people listening to the podcast that are more experienced you know these guys that might be spending you know tens of thousands a month um, you know very experienced in terms of their account structure their, their setup what are some of the real recent updates within the merchant center that they might not be aware of I know we've touched on quite a lot to be fair so I know I'm, I'm testing you a bit here but yeah um a couple more things that are a bit more recent uh, that are maybe less talked about or brand new you know I know we talked about high school which not many people know about we've talked about um um the free google shopping you know and and things like that but what else is there in there in the merchant center side that maybe yeah, so what well, one thing a lot of people aren't aware of is um I mean, we all know Google changes the algorithm. You know, we, you know, people are forever chasing it. I say the, the you know, don't chase the algorithm. You know, beat your competitors. They're, they're the people you should be trying to yeah, yeah. out. Yeah. Um, but w Google also update the specification for product feeds. Yeah. Um, so obviously, it will affect different things depending on what you're doing. Um, they have recently announced, so there was a couple that came into play almost straight away. So I think, I think it was June, June time when they made the announcements to this year's changes. Um, so a couple of them, for example, I won't go through them all because there was quite a few of them, but a couple that were quite interesting to us through some of the clients we deal with is one known as... Um, Installment and subscription cost attributes. So these okay. have been added yeah. into the, the product feed spec. Yeah. If you're dealing with sort of wireless products and the services category. Yeah. Um, so a good example of that would be um, if you're selling mobile phones. Yeah. And yeah. you have an option to purchase the phone outright or via installment. Yeah. That's a good one because I think more and more and more e-com stores are, are adding subscription. You know, we've got clients that sell coffee, for example, you know, and they are adding right now. They don't have subscription, but by the time this podcast airs in about a week's time, they will have subscription. So we'll be able to put their subscription offer through their Google Shopping account. You yeah, know, it'd so be an interesting one to watch that because at the minute, it, it looks as if they're only going to put it on certain product categories. But mm. I think if it's successful there, they'll roll it out elsewhere so effectively it will allow you to show both prices yeah. so the full price you know price. buy it this price or you can buy it very useful this very useful. yeah 
Um, another one is um, changes to the product detail attribute. So yeah. this is a new. So this will allow you to provide technical specs that aren't covered by the normal attributes. Okay. Um, so it has three required sub attributes to do it. So section name, attribute name, and attribute value. And again, using you using your mobile phone again, an example of this would be to include product detail on the capacity of the mobile phone's battery. Yeah. So your section name could be battery, attribute name, capacity, yeah. and the value is you know yeah. four thousand. Wow. Maybe whatever it is, you know the actual. Yeah, there. Whatever. Yeah. Actually, like um, so again, it's it's another way of providing. It's not. I don't think they're going to put it as a required. If yeah. you use if you use the attribute, then there are those requirements. So use you must be able to show those three variables. But again, there's quite a few products out there where I could see that being a really useful addition. Um, another one is category specific um, requirement. So media and clothing uh, that require additional attributes. So again, we touched on that earlier with things yeah. like gender, age group, yeah. uh, size, color. It's an important one, isn't it? <coughs> you know, clothing. Clothing is obviously a huge part of our business. <coughs> well, they're making those now. Currently, like I mentioned earlier, they are um, optional. Yeah. So if you're selling clothing, it is optional to add gender, age group, size, yeah. color. Um, you know, well, we like, were saying like a lot of these things, that. though, isn't it? You know, a lot of these things are optional. But if you're if you're yeah. out there, you know, you said I've been taking it back for like three minutes. We're not trying to chase the algorithm. We're trying to beat the competitors. I mean, that's that's the reality. You know, so yeah. all those other competitors that are doing shopping, and if you're if you're in a niche. 99% of niches are very competitive. There's a few exceptions, but mainly, you know, most things you buy, you need that competitive edge. Now, whether that's, you know, negoti negotiating an extra 5% of the cost, better terms, better warehousing, better deals with the courier, all those things, okay, great. But if everyone then is taking a feed, putting it into the merchant center, pushing it through, you, know, you can get a massive, massive competitive edge on your ad spend if you've got the best feed. You know, if you've got 100 out of 100 score, you know, on your feed. And some of these things you're saying there, you know, if you sell clothing, you need to be breaking the variables down. You need to be creating these custom variables. You need to be breaking everything down to a every single variable that is in your account needs to be populated. And if yeah. it's not, it needs to be a damn good discussion and reason why not, because that gives you the competitive edge. Because what that does, it means that when you're showing your ads, your ads are triggering correctly for the correct search terms more than your competitors are because they've just gone and put, oh, well, I sell men's size 12 shoes. Well, what about, you know, is there a width? Is there a brand? Is there a color? Is there, of course, you might have some of this stuff, but will you have it all? And these new variables give you another layer of sort of exclusivity for a while because quite often most people are busy, lazy, whichever one you want to go with, busy usually, you know, or they're leaving, you know, another agency or their expert to do it. So, you know, some great, great tips there. So what we're going to do is move that, on. Just one thing on that last one really is, is a good heads up from Google because they have actually stated now yeah. within the, the, if you don't use those attributes, your products will still remain eligible to serve, but the performance may be limited. So it's Google saying, you know, if That's you want exactly to beat your is. competitors, yeah, do it. And I think it is the what it is the one, you know, we, we, you know, it is the one where we just see, obviously we've been using shopping, it doesn't work, we've been using shopping, but we're not at, but straight away, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out, is sort of the analogy, you know, you've got a basic, you know, it's like you've got base, basic nutrition going in, your overall long-term health is going to be substandard. <laughs> so, yeah. so, right, we're going to finish off with a couple of SEO bits, because now not okay. only, <laughs> not only does Andy sort of head up our technical, well, he, the umbrella is sort of technical head of lead of all our technical services and the technical team. Um, so that's sort of the, the ad side, but also the SEO side. Now we wanted this to be focused primarily on feed, but I thought it'd be good just to get your opinion on some of the sort of technical aspects of SEOs. So I think when we say technical SEO, it gets a bit, Oh, you know, people get a bit <laughs> like, Oh, flipping it. Here we go. You know, Panic. <laughs> we're going to talk about metadata and site speed again for the next nine years, or, you know, there's a bit more to it, obviously. 
um, you know, with the, than, than, than sort of a couple of things. But, you know, where would you say, where's the best place to start, you know, for these guys, they're on the podcast, they, you know, that maybe maybe starting out, you know, or they're doing their million quid a month, you know, and, and everything in between. What would be a good go-to start point for somebody to go and have a look? you know, at their technical elements of their SEO that could maybe just, you know, really, you know, find that one or two things that you quite often see that really can might be able to move the needle if they're not right. Well, what would be a couple of tips you can give us there? I mean, it, a lot of the time we, people get confused by tech. If you're looking at SEO, really, there's sort of a couple of elements. So you've got your on page. And then you've got everything else that you do that sort of drives stuff to the page. Yeah. Technical SEO really is the behind the scenes elements yeah. that power the growth of your website, such as site architecture, yeah. um, mobile optimization, page speed. And they're not, you know, they're not the sexiest things to sort of investigate and quite often they're difficult to investigate. Yeah. Um, but there's tools there. I mean, if you're going to start, doing any work on your site then i would say the first port of call really is to do an audit of the site yeah. Yeah. um so you you can't start to make changes unless you understand yeah. the way the site is built already so you look at your site maps for example we quite often see sites that don't even have an yeah. xml site map yet it's a key factor for pushing into uh, search console or yeah. you know google's crawlers will come along and one of the first things they will look at is the robots.txt file yeah and if your site maps in the robots.txt file then they'll go oh actually they're providing us a map for the site let's have a look there yeah. and that is where they'll go next yeah um you know and it that's a it's a key technical area that a lot of people ignore yeah a lot of people also let those get too big. A good thing with sitemaps, and it, this is a relatively new thing with sitemaps as well, is there's always been limits to the size of a sitemap. And, and it, people have always sort of touted that as 50,000 URLs. People now are breaking that down to more finite, manageable chunks. So we're seeing sitemaps now that are limiting to 10,000 URLs. But multiple seeing, sitemaps. So that's yeah, yeah. So we're looking at, you know, on big sites, breaking, breaking the navigation at a top level, so your cat, your top level categories as a sitemap for... So if you've got a site that is shirts, trousers, boots, you know, a sitemap for each of those... Yeah components yeah. because what we're seeing is it's giving the robots most people think robots are crawling their site all the time they're actually not they come very rarely and when they do come they've got a finite amount of time and then they're off again yeah so yeah. if we can break your site down into yeah. more sort of bite-sized chunks yeah so that, and that goes with the navigation as well you know yeah yeah uh, you know site speed is another big thing and and it's going to be more so yeah next year um things are changing again you know the algorithm's changing again and so, stuff like that. so you say okay so technical seo you know we talked about crawlability there architecture you know speed we always talk about speed let's not talk about speed again <laughs> <laughs> um but, Unfortunately, that's one of the key I know, elements. I know, I know, I know. Everyone tells me I'm to say that <laughs> because it's so important. It's so important. You know, if you go in with the web, you go and search console now. It's all in there as well. And, yeah. You know, clearly, you know, they've been given us given us a clue for about five years, haven't they? But it's still the new new thing, speed. But yeah, yeah, it will always be. You know, the reality is, you know, Google wants to deliver the right result. If you've got a good experience, which is fast, you find what you want quick. You know, speed, bounce rate you know, it's going to be good. So you say about doing an audit. So some of those things you're going to find in an audit, but for those guys that go, all right, well, how do I, where do I start? What's the start point with, with a bit of software? What sort of software, what's the software go to, to start to do some audit pieces? What, where would you go software wise to do an audit? Oh, I'm, I'm me personally, I, I, the 
tool I use is a tool called Screaming Frog. Yeah. Um, you can get a free version of yeah. Screaming Frog. It will limit you to a certain number of URLs yeah. or there's a paid option. It's not a massive cost. You know, it's not, yeah. it's not like the SEM rushes and AHREFs where it's going to cost you several hundred pounds a month or I think, it, I think it's about a hundred and something pound a year, Screaming Frog. Um, but if you really want to do it at, at, at the base level, yeah, then I would say Search Console. Yeah, uh, both actually, not just Google Search Console. People ignore Bing, and they ignore Bing at their peril. Um, it is still not got the, anywhere near the market share that Google has, and probably never yeah. will have. Yeah, um, but they have developed a pretty impressive set of tools for yeah. looking at your site and they've just done a major overhaul of their interface and put a built-in um, audit system yeah. which is, that's something search console doesn't have yeah. you need to understand search console to, to work with it very you know they're too free you know there's free up obviously search console's free well, well yeah it yeah always be free it should always be free um okay so we've got search console we've got screaming frog you know dive in there get stuck in um you know and i think it's one of those things or two things there that you know you need to get used to going into you need to get used to you know using and getting some routines in there i think we've written various written various blogs over the years on um on our seo traffic lab um i think um, one of the teams actually working on a new yeah. Uh, so watch out for that one. They they are currently writing one on the new features of um, Search Console and Bing yeah. Webmaster. So, so Bing's known as Bing Webmaster Tools. Yeah. Um, and it is very similar. Yeah. To Search. In fact, I I actually think it's more powerful than Search Console. Yeah. Yeah. Not not utilized like you say. You know. Like yeah. Yeah. It's very underutilized. Do it, yeah. As we always do. We've had that. I remember doing a. Well, it was my colleague actually. Well, Henry did a talk on ads, and a guy asked a question in the crowd, and you know, sort of a well-known, locally well-known businessman around here. So, what do you think of Bing? He said, and he was sort of saying it jokingly, as if we would say, "Oh, waste of time." And obviously, what we said was, "Well, it's fantastic, you know, for for cheap leads, you know, especially on paid ads, you know, and it's easier." Yeah, paid right? definitely. And he's like, "Really? What's a waste of time? You don't get anything." But yeah, let everyone think that. Well, you, well. Us and our clients are busy picking up the you know the cheaper cost of conversions, the easier rankings, yeah. you know, because the reality is, you know, there isn't thousands of people trying to dominate that space. You know, there's a few. So, no. you know, being I like, say being um, being webmaster tools equivalent, um, you know, great good, great ones. Well, right. I can't remember what their share of the uh, search data is. At yeah, the it's still it's still very low. But if you think yeah. about the fact that there are billions. Of searches yeah. a day. If you can get four then... percent <laughs> of your leads at half price, yeah. Why will you not be? It's a simple maths, really. Yeah, and there yeah. are people that will only use Bing to search. Yeah. They won't use Google. I think so... on paid ads, we've got clients that are say doing a hundred grand on um, a month on on shopping, and they spend about ten grand a month on Bing. So it's about ten percent on the paid ads. We find is normal. Yeah. And I think on the SEO side, organic, I think it's a bit less. Um, personally, um, yeah. But, it's so, definitely a powerful tool. So yeah. So thanks, Andy. We're we're going to draw this to an end. It's been a fantastic. Uh, God, time just flies by. I think we're scraping <laughs> on. We're scraping on the hour. So so Tracking. many great takeaways there. You know, I think um, you know, I think the big one for me, you know, is just don't be scared of this sort of technical element. You know, it's so important to get in there, you know, get in the emergency center, understand the basics, make sure you get a clean set of data, and then start. You know, that's your eighty twenty. And then start layering in these more advanced features. You know, these these more advanced sort of things around different pricing grids for your, um, you know, for your delivery. Adding in product data to variables, making sure all the variables you, you're you're filling them in, <laughs> custom variables, custom labels. Um, you know, and then optimizing everywhere that you can. And obviously looking at some of these SEO um, type tips as well. So I always like to end every episode, Andy, on a book recommendation. Now, I know for a fact that you are a huge, huge reader, so we could be here for some time. So I want you to give me one book recommendation, one. not five. <laughs> right. So I'll go for the one that's permanently on my desk then, shall I? 
that. Uh, the, this book never leaves my desk. It is a quite technical one, but it's an important one as well because it's another thing that we haven't really discussed today, but another area I look yeah. after. And uh, you can see that. So that's Google Analytics breakthrough. Yeah. From zero um, to business impact. Ferris, Alu, yeah. Alola, Shiraz. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce their names. So. Eric Fetterman. I'm Eric Fetterman is well known in, in, in the industry for, for yeah. stuff to do with. And the reason I like this book is it's not a, it's a, it's a fairly hefty book, as you can see. Um, and it would probably scare most people if they picked it up off a shelf and looked and gone, God, that's a bit technical. <laughs> it is. It covers a lot of the technical aspects of Google Analytics, how to set it up, how to get the best out of it, how to understand the data that you're getting. But it's a, one of those books where you can go, oh, how do I do so-and-so? Jump straight in. Yeah. Read that bit. Go and do it. Yeah. You don't have to read the whole book. You don't have to become an expert. I, I, you know, I'm not an expert. I'm not a. I'm not a believer in experts on yeah. things. To be fair, because you're always learning. Yeah. You have got knowledgeable people. Yeah. And Anybody that put, calls yourself an expert, yeah, that's that's not a great start. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, brilliant people book. Kind of an expert. Yeah. Uh, absolutely cracking book. You can read it all if you if you're yeah. that way inclined. But yeah, I mean, I'm I'm quite familiar with it, and I would definitely sort of endorse it. I know it breaks down sort of specific sort of scenarios yeah. within a business. You know, if you've got this, you know, Fred had a business that did X, Y, Z, and he was concerned about how to track this. You know, so he talks about a B two B and e com and different case study specifics where you can use e com um, analytics and data. You know, and that's very much you know what we as an agency stand for. You know, our you know, our agency tagline, you know, for our SEO agency is performance driven digital marketing, you yeah. know, and that can only be done if you know where you are with the numbers. So that, that book, yeah, I know is Andy's Bible for, <laughs> I think for, you've had that about five years, I think, haven't you, that one? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, I think uh, uh, analytics is a whole, yeah. yeah, it's a whole new podcast. I think. Well, well I think you've just sorted that out then. So <laughs> see Andy back on the podcast um, in a few weeks time or a few couple of months time, I think maybe more than that's, Maybe one for you know later in the year when we look at analytic at the analytics side of SEO and PPC as well because I know that's one where a lot of people get things wrapped around the neck and there's nothing worse than not knowing your numbers in, in my mind you know as a business owner so right well thank you Andy now for the guys that are listening in that would like to maybe reach out to you connect with you what's the best place and best way of connecting with you Andy um well, I'm all, I'm on LinkedIn yeah um I can't remember what my tab is if you search for Andy Burkett, and you'll find me under Ecom One and SEO Traffic Lab, yeah. uh, or via email. So, Andy at SEO Traffic Lab dot com or Andy at Ecom One dot com, and I'm always checking those. Yeah, uh, but fine. yeah, I'm on link. I'm quite active on LinkedIn, so yeah, it should be easy enough to find me. Okay, guys. Well, thank you for listening to this uh, this episode. Obviously, a fantastic episode. Lots of real nuggets there from Andy on the technical side of the Merchant Center and some of the SEO bits. Obviously, looking forward to getting Andy back on the podcast in a couple of months. I have a feeling Andy's going to become a, a regular 